I'm Thomas Story. And I'm Justin Moreno. And we're two friends who have a podcast. We still don't have a title, although by the time you hear this, we should have a title. But this is episode two of that podcast. Two friends, two episodes. Two friends, two friends. Two okay. friends. We're doing this on Zoom, so there's no way we can be in sync. I mean, it sounds in sync to me. I'm a filmmaker. I'm a scientist. And we're two friends who've made movies together. And launched a company together. And we lost our money. And our identity. But we are finding ourselves again. And this is our podcast. This is it. Welcome. Second Second episode episode. number two. How many more to go? That's not how it works. (laughs) Not with that attitude. In this episode, Thomas continues his trend of taking a dump on things that everyone loves. This time with Netflix. Okay, hold on. It's only because they might be ruining cinematic art as we know it. Not because I don't love their content. And we get a little personal with our experiences with trauma and the things people say that affect us. Really keeping it light, aren't we? All that and more on episode two of our podcast. That still is waiting to be named. Cue the music. It's already playing. What do you want to, what do you want to talk about today? Um, is that a typewriter to your right? This is a typewriter. Awesome. This is like a fun pandemic thing that I did with my kids. I, I had this the keyboard, and I think I don't remember. Actually, it might have been the keyboard that we used in premise, but it's a mechanical keyboard, you know. So it's like click, 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 clack, 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 clack. And um, my daughter loves it. And so when I set up her up for school, I let her use that. That's her like her keyboard for uh, virtual school. And she was asking me about like why, what's the difference, and all the stuff. And I was talking to her about the mechanical springs and the feedback and all that stuff, and how it was, you know people were trying to replicate the typewriter and she's like, what's a typewriter? And I was like, <laughs> and again, this is kind of going back to what we were talking about last time, how we're like in this what's weird type writer in this weird, like, uh, age range where I did, did you ever use a typewriter as a kid for school? Um, I mean, uh, I, yeah, there was like one yes. year, you know, or like in my, the early years of school where I had to type something and, and I typed it on a typewriter. We had a computer and a printer super early. Cause my dad was in, uh, his computer consultant. I remember using his typewriter. I don't know if I remember using it with anything formally, but I remember printing stuff on like a dot matrix printer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I remember that too. So then I remember um, when we got our first computer, you know, with like the the black screen green mm-hmm. print. And DOS. And um, DOS and like learning DOS commands and shit. And, you know, and so obviously it like I got really excited. And so then I, I went and found like, what's the coolest looking typewriter I can find on eBay? That is not a thousand dollars because shit, man. There is a market for little like, cottage industry. Yeah, for old like mint. They condition. probably still make um, them. They, they they do, but they don't have that vintage. Like this okay. is like Bakelite. It's actually made by brother. You know, yeah. brother. They make printer. Oh yeah, you're a big brother printer fan. So it's funny. I have a brother printer. I've got a brother typewriter, and I have a brother sewing machine. I was talking about the kids about those brands who make a lot of different things well, like Yamaha makes yeah, and samsung and samsung well that was my my son brought up samsung because we have a samsung tv he knows the samsung phones and we have a samsung washing washer and dryer i knew yamaha as a keyboard company and then they also were a great drum company because i played drums and i had a yamaha and it was very you know it was a reputable brand and of course and then like they make boats and they make really good boats and they make motorcycles yeah, motors I mean, yeah, they're, they're motors in general. You know, the history of Samsung is really cool in that, like, they started out as rice farmers. And then they, like, they kept expanding into the next downstream market, right? So then they got tired of that. So they got into distrib- – they got tired of paying their distributors, right? Like, their physical distributors. So they got into rice distribution. Then they got tired of paying their the boat builders. So they got into boat building. Wow. And and the boat building – and again, this is could be somewhat apocryphal or just incorrect, but – um, the boat, boat building is where they really rose into the, like the billionaire status because mm-hmm. they started building, you know, these mega freighters. Um, and then from there, they're like, well, maybe why don't we build our own electronics for our ships? And they just got more and more vertical. Yeah. Now they are even into biotech. I used to work with Samsung Biologics before it became BioEpsis. Um, and they are just, I mean, it, the South Koreans would make us like us, like, you know, uh, Fortune 500. $80 billion company, super innovative, make us feel like layabouts. <laughs> we, I would hear about their day. I'm like, you work 16 hours a day, sleep at the office, and you do that six days a week with a, quote, optional seventh day off? <laughs> like, people are crazy. 
All right. You ready? How, how are we going to do this? Follow my lead. Justin, what was the last movie you saw? Oh, God, don't. Well, that's a terrible question to ask me. Um, the last movie I saw, it might have been Knives Out. How'd you watch it? Uh, via Amazon Prime, streamed to my TV. So you have a subscription to Amazon Prime? I do. Have you ever rented a movie in the last year? Oh, yeah. Or I, have you I guess that's, only watched movies you could get through subscription or free? I, I paid to rent Soul. I forgot about that one. That that was more recent than Knives Out. Pay, oh, pay. you don't have a Disney Plus subscription? No, we don't. I think we might get one, you know, because everybody all of a sudden wants to watch Mandalorian. But um, What subscription services do you subscribe to? We've got For Netflix. Streaming. We've got Amazon Prime. We've got Hulu. Um, I think we have stars, but accidentally, and like we can't figure out how to cancel it. Do you find your relationship to movies changing with how heavily we use streaming services now? Yeah, I, I don't know if it is. It's hard for me to kind of disentangle the uh, like 2020 consumption pattern versus it feels like 2020 sort of forced us into what a lot of these streaming services were already going for. But, you know, there used to be like the anticipation, the excitement of films. And then, you know, there've been a couple of times where it's like, oh, that I remember seeing a preview for this and it, it's been out for five weeks. Okay. I guess that's, you know, and you sort of lost some of the sort of anticipatory effect, but also I, I find myself more often like watching movies while I fold laundry or something like that, which is something that I, yeah. I hate. And I, you know, if it's, if it's something I think that is good. I, I I would prefer to like sit down and actually watch it and focus instead of or like pausing it. Like I think there there was a big thing with some De Niro film that came out um earlier this year where like The Irishman? There, yeah, the Irishman, where there were like these online guides of how you could break it up into a three part series. And then, you know, uh was it Scorsese the director it was like, No, it's supposed to be yeah. watched in one sitting. And it's like, but it's three hours. How do you So anyway, that you know, that's one My of the My brother in law Micah literally thought he was watching a TV series. When he was watching The Irishman, he thought he like consumed a whole season and then he was waiting for like season two. And then he realized, oh, I just well, that was just a movie. And similarly, he's had experiences where he was watching a TV series and he's like, why is this movie going on so long? And he just he has no concept uh, of what what is like what is being consumed in front of him. Um, and it's really funny. He jokes about it. I think most people would probably say more content at our disposal is better. And even some content creators would say the quickest, easiest way to get my content before eyeballs, the better. And I think you can make that case. I'm not going to make the case. I'm going to make the other case because I come at it not as a content creator, but as an artist. And that might sound pretentious. It is what it is. I, I see film as art and I see myself as an artist. It doesn't mean it's like great art or high art. But the nature of which I express myself through the medium of film is by nature artistic. So that's all I'm trying to say when I say approach it as art. It's the way it is motivated, the way it comes out of me, is as any artistic medium would come out of an artist. I'm not trying to make a comment on how good it is or not. And I think art, the best art, is highly entertaining and is appeals to a wide audience. And so I definitely don't want to create art at the exclusion of entertainment and enjoyment. And I think things that are just made to be entertained and consumed can also be very artistic. So these aren't mutually exclusive ideas. But what I am seeing over the last few years is a misunderstanding of film as art, certainly by Netflix. Of all the streaming services, Netflix is the worst offender for how they view film. It doesn't seem evident to me that Netflix views films as art. They view them as consumables. For instance, I recently watched Mank, David Fincher's new film Gary, starring Gary Oldman about the writer Herman Mankiewicz who wrote Citizen Kane. It's a high art film. It's a prestige film. Everybody involved was making a piece of art. It's going to be an Oscar contender. A lot of great reviews. And Netflix financed it, so they're putting it on their streaming. So I turned it on. I wasn't into it. 
It was okay. It was a little kind of all over the place. For whatever reason, I didn't feel like watching it, and I turned it off like an hour in. Hmm. And it occurred to me that Netflix just enabled me to just treat this film, this work of art, as just something to be consumed. It is a buffet of food, and I picked Mank, wasn't into it, and I put it back. Had I rented it... Hold on. First of all, that's not how buffets work. I I hope. That's not how oh, you... Oh, you don't put... You don't put your food back? When you don't like it? I don't like these Big eggs. Buffet? I'm just going to slide these back in there. Oh, sure. man. It explains a lot. I don't know what buffets you're going to. Um, but uh, had I rented the film, had I gone to the theater, I would have finished right, the film. Right, because you paid for and it. And possibly, because I paid for it. And, maybe, and I would have possibly enjoyed it. enjoyed it. I would have fully appreciated the art before me. I might have still not liked it, because I certainly haven't liked a lot of films that I've paid to see. There's a plot, there's, there's a way to present art and I can make the same analogy. I can further the analogy with food. We go to fine restaurants, not because we want finer food, but we want a finer experience. And it was actually a chef who kind of opened my eyes to fine dining. And he was saying, the reason I put, you know, five raviolis on the plate is because I want you to ex- respect the ingredients. So when you're not, you don't have a plate full of food. You actually have to respect the ingredients. You're going to actually consume the food differently because you're paying a lot for something that you then want to appreciate. So the whole dining experience furthers that experience of art as the culinary art. You are going in for an atmosphere. You're sitting down. You're being waited on. You go through a multi-course meal. The buffet is an apt analogy because I can get a Wolfgang Puck meal or some fine chef meal at a buffet And if it's just about consuming good food, then why go to the restaurant? Why have limited portions? Why not just give me what I want when I want it? And Netflix is creating – they're putting the Wolfgang Puck meals right alongside you know, Chinese takeout or McDonald's, all of which are good things. In in the context that you you consume them. Correct. The problem, it's not just like a, you know, hey, get off my lawn. I want to be a purist. The problem, there's actually a film preservation problem that I am seeing. Because if Netflix is presenting its art this way, and for me, it's betraying a misunderstanding of how they view films, that they don't inherently see a film as a piece of art to be presented in a way, but as simply something to be consumed. And I'm falling victim to it because I am I consumed Mank, and I didn't even finish it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was disappointing to me. Now, I can certainly finish it, but it's creating a class of consumer rather than art appreciator. The problem comes with art preservation. And if you believe that art should be something that can be owned, like a piece of art on my wall, and now obviously I'm not owning the art itself. I'm owning a representation of the art, granted, but I well, can own you. As, I mean, it's sort of in the, the level that we are. There are some people who they who do actually own can the buy art. the original prints, right? But there is something about um, a fr- a freedom we should have as art appreciators, and even if we're just consumers, to be able to own the art that we want. If film moves completely to streaming, the problem with a Netflix film is that I can't own a piece of art. I can only access it through a paywall subscription service. And Mm -hmm. if I stop paying them for a subscription, I cannot even see the art. Yeah. Now, a few filmmakers have said, Netflix, we're going to let you finance our films and put it on your service and maybe own it. I don't know how the ownership worked out, but we are going to demand a Blu-ray release, a Criterion release, or I don't even know if they could demand it, but The Irishman and Roma are two films that were Netflix films that you can actually buy the Blu-ray collector's edition on Criterion. Right, collection. but that's that's got to be because it's Scorsese and whoever else. I, and I could make, Alfonso Cuarón. I could exactly. make that demand. I mean, assuming I could even get on Netflix. Exactly. And I think about this myself. Would I work with Netflix? And my it feels like at this point, you know, and I can make all the demands I want because Netflix doesn't know who I am. They don't care about me. But I would say at the very least – If you're going to own a film, like it it can't only live behind a subscription paywall. It has to be available to be owned. And right now, even if I buy and download a digital download of a film, like I buy a film on iTunes and I own it, I don't actually own that film. Right. I can, I only still access it through my iTunes 
software, I can access it offline. But if iTunes loses the license to that film, it actually will get deleted from my library, or at least that's happened. And that's a terrifying thing. So there's, we've got to be able to solve the artist's dilemma of having films in a society that is consuming them as consumables, like on a buffet table. Mm-hmm. And like We can't escape that. That is the way it's going to happen. But how can we then create art that can be preserved, that can be owned, and hopefully can we continue to create art that is presented a certain way? And I'm singling out Netflix because I feel like Hulu and Amazon are doing this better. And it just feels like there are people at Hulu and Amazon who really view films as art. And so they're creating an atmosphere where filmmakers can make a film that is owned by either of those companies and that will release on their streaming service, but that also gets the other means of exhibition of traditional film art, whether it's a theatrical release, whether it's a DVD or Blu-ray release, or the other ways that people can consume it. And I believe that actually could end up being more financially viable too. I mean, Manchester by the Sea is a great example where Amazon either financed it or bought it. I think they might have acquired it. But they gave it a real dedicated theatrical release. And because it had that, it made a ton of money in theaters. It got all these Oscar nominations. Which, which one they, was they that, you said? Manchester by the Sea. Okay. Then they put it on its streaming service. Now, the state of film, notwithstanding because of COVID, you know, we'll work out a new normal of how that is. But if COVID is helping film get crunched further into the consumable buffet table, and away from film as art, I mean, that would be that would be a uh, detrimental progress to film. Yeah, you know, I'm curious, and <clears throat> I don't know if there is a, a way to answer this question, but, you know, Netflix has been doing this longer than Hulu and uh, longer than, than Amazon Prime. And so I wonder if this I, – I have to imagine that in the beginning, you know, Netflix was made up of people who loved film. I, I loved Netflix in the early days, especially because of its access to foreign film that you just could not find locally right um and so they've been doing this a lot early days like when they were a dvd service dvd yeah when it was dvd only um and you know and then they evolved and then you know uh how long ago it was like maybe five years ago netflix did its first theatrical release beast of a nation carrie fukunaga you know who you're a big fan of um and honestly, I don't know any details about that. I don't know, like, did it go well or, or what? But that was like a big deal when it happened. There was like Netflix is doing a theatrical release. Did they learn from that that this is not a good idea? You're talking about this art preservation idea. And I, I think that is true and, and it's noble. But I, I find this sort of the other, you know, more concrete part of the buffet analogy to, to be more problematic in that like Netflix, it's – often like very hard to find something like that I want to watch to the point that, you know, there's like there are memes about like, you know, scrolling Netflix for longer than it would have taken to watch a movie. But, you know, I think part of it, number, first of all, like I've been angry for years since they got rid of their old rating system, their five-star rating system, because I feel like that um, algorithm was fantastic and it, it did a really good job predicting with this thumbs up, thumbs down bullshit. Like it is, very rarely correct it like pretty much it says every netflix original is like a 98 percent match i'm like really this does not seem like my sort of thing and, and i think there are good netflix originals and then there are mediocre netflix originals that are watchable you know or whatever but you know like I'm trying to think of jingle jangle enola holmes you know these are ones that have come out recently that i think are it's also it's hard to tell what you know netflix will apply its netflix original also to things that have been released overseas so all the things you are describing, I and and your issues with Netflix are additional pieces of evidence showing me that this is not a company run by people who understand film as art. All of those things. Their app is terrible. It's just a smorgasbord of content, and it's not even elegantly laid out. There's not a good search function because they don't fundamentally view these things as art they're just consumables they're only going to be pushing the latest thing to consume versus hulu has a much more elegant app and there's even ones like you know the criterion collection and shutter i mean and you know uh movie these apps 
are so much more elegantly designed because they're designed by people who love film and they want film to be presented a certain way. Mm -hmm. The rating system, not even knowing what is a true Netflix original. Because you're right, if they acquire something or if they just get the U.S. rights for something, they will slap that attribution on it in the same way that if they were going to fund it and develop it in-house from the ground up, a Netflix original. And like it would either be the producer or the director whose name would sort of get promoted as a Tim Burton film, right. a Steven Spielberg film, a you know Roger Corman film. Netflix films, it says a Netflix film. It's like – which is like a really frustrating thing. Yeah, it's very it just, it, c- commoditized it's, version. Right. It's further evidence. It's like, okay, you're – you are ignoring the artist in favor of yourself as a company. I mean, there's no other distributors was like, you know, it would be like Paramount releases, Warner Brothers releases a so-and-so's film. Filmmakers had to fight to put their names equal size as Netflix now. And, And I'm sure Netflix is full of people who love film. I know people who work at Netflix and I know them to be film lovers, film art appreciators. But the people at the top don't seem to be that way. Or maybe what's helped turn the tide because Netflix is improving in this area. They're just going at a snail's pace. Their app still sucks. Their algorithms still suck, but at least more of their films are getting like a Blu-ray or theatrical release. Now, Beast of No Nation got a theatrical release so that it could qualify for Oscars. So Netflix's only interest in putting that film into theaters was mm. to qualify for Oscars, which demands a two week release. Then they went and bought a theater so that they could satisfy that requirement and not really have to, pay to put their films in theaters that's kind of, that's kind of gross um there's already antitrust laws preventing studios from owning theaters so i don't even know how that's going to work out now covid sort of suspended all that but there are filmmakers who want true theatrical releases or true uh, other ways that people can appreciate their art and potentially even own it if they want that netflix is gonna have to contend with i think or otherwise they're not going to get the level of artists they want and they've shown they'll play ball alfonso Cuaron, roma martin scorsese Irishman. So if they continue in that trajectory, I think they'll get there. This is something that's increasingly becoming like a, a an important issue for me. I do fear a future where we can't own the art that we want to appreciate, that we want to own, specifically film art. We can't own it. And it is then presented in a way where it is just a product to be consumed on a buffet table. And I having that experience with Mank a couple weeks ago, I was like, this is a problem. This is not the future of film I want. I, it is interesting, because, especially because Netflix is such a juggernaut. You know, I think about when uh, Trolls 2 came out. You know, it's like one of those early, big pandemic, like it was exciting because somebody decided to pull the trigger on, you know, canning their uh, theatrical and going digital and you know as much as i hate to admit it i think i spent 60 bucks renting that film like i think i rented it three times because you know my kids wanted to see it because of user error no (laughs) no because they wanted to see it again three days later and you know and and that was it wasn't a lot of times you know lower level films it's like rent or buy or if it's been out for a while rent or buy but trolls was i mean you know it was rental only and you got had it for 48 hours or whatever so my kids wanted to watch it and it was like you know the pandemic and we're not going anywhere. So it's like, all right, fine. I'll drop another 20 bucks. And my in-laws did the same thing. They rented it for the kids like three times. So just between like, essentially for two children, it's been 120 bucks on that film. A couple of weeks ago, I had this like just terrible internet, like internet was down hours every day for like five or six days in a row. Um, and the kids wanted to like, one of their favorite shows is core, um, legends of Korra, which is like the follow on from, um, the last airbender, which, both are actually really fantastic shows, you, not just kids shows, but just great shows in general. Um, and, but the internet was out and what do you do? And, and so like, and, and it's just like another one of those things that they don't understand. Like they don't understand that you have to like turning the TV on at a certain time to watch a show. And I feel like such an old man, even like giving them shit about this, but the, I was like, no, no, the internet's not working. We can't watch it. And they're like, well, okay. But you know, what about on the TV? I'm like, no, but that's still the internet. It's not working like, you know. So you don't own a Blu-ray or DVD player anymore? But I mean, I don't have those sh- those shows. Oh, those particular shows. Yeah. 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 On, on, I mean, on We Blu- still have a healthy disc library. But yeah, I, I've even stopped buying movies. Y- y- physical ones? I mean, 
physical ones because and I'm a collector. Yeah. And, and so I've got my list, but I'm 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 increasingly less motivated to buy the physical ones. I guess really I, I utilize them when I'm in a project, writing or directing a project, and I want to get all the reference material mm-hmm. right in front of me. And I want to look at the director commentary, the behind the scenes. So whenever I'm doing a new project, I will get my stack of DVDs or Blu-rays of films that are kind of in that wheelhouse. Or if I don't own them, I'll buy them. So because I really utilize them in a way that uh, streaming them is is less efficient, if assuming they have special features. But I want to, and right now I'm saving as much money as I can, so I'm not just dropping 20 bucks on a Blu-ray. But my dream is to have all of my favorite movies on a shelf. Right. Not just because I'm a collector and I like it, although that's good enough reason, and not because I think that Netflix is going to turn off the switch, <laughs> and but they could. They have the control. They have the power to well, just and sometimes you remove know, access to all this art. Well, and Netflix, you know, will lose films, and I don't understand fully the mechanics of that. But like, you know, there are websites that are dedicated to what's going, like what's leaving Netflix this month. Like, watch it before it goes. Yep. And so again, I don't understand. The, well, those are things they've licensed, so right. those are things you could ostensibly buy or rent elsewhere. Well, but that's one of those things. If you don't own it and you just sort of accept – But they're encouraging you not to pay for it. Right. They're encouraging you only to try to stream well, it. Well, and it's interesting. You know, I, I'm – the way that you are about Blu-rays and stuff, I feel like I am about books. Um, a lot. So I, often I will uh, – like I'll buy an ebook, especially when I was traveling more, and I wanted to be able to have multiple books and I would like, you know – I have an old school Kindle because I like the white paper thing. Um, and I like the ebook. Also, if it's something that I'm going to be referencing, I, I really like the search function, which you just don't have. But I would always buy a hard copy of it. You know, and I don't know why. I, I love paper and I love the smell of old books and all that kind of stuff. But also, like, there's something, and this is really, it, it sort of it was always a fanciful idea, but it's really borne out in the pandemic is the idea of having books on a shelf. Um, like watching my daughter's reading explode to where she's walking over and be like, what's this book? Is this a book I can read? And I'm like, yeah. And anything on the shelf you can read. And she like, pick, you know, picks up Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy or, you know, um, Lord of the Rings, uh, Fellowship of the Ring, which both of us reread and realized, wow, this book is horrible. <laughs> it's the worst book. Um, you know, but just ha- like if those weren't on the shelf, if they were in an e-reader and she was just looking at titles, right? And that's sort of best case scenario that I could even get her to that point. But, you know, she's just bored and she walks over. And so we ended up moving a book, a bookshelf filled with all of these books into her room. And now she just pulls one off and just start reading it. And then we'll realize like two days later, she's finished it and moved on to another book. I, I imagine there's a somewhat parallel experience when you own a DVD or a Blu-ray that it's, it's just not the same as, as the endless scrolling options of Netflix that are overwhelming. You're absolutely Sorry. right. And I, I attribute my love for film. The first enabler of that was the South Windsor Public Library. I would go to the library and they had a great VHS collection and I would just stare at the shelf and I'd be like, oh, I've heard of that. The Godfather. I've heard of that. I've heard of that. And I would, when I got of age where I could ride my bike there and became a teenager, I would fill in all the gaps, you know, and, and I was naturally loving film, so I was wanting to watch all these classics. I'd go to the library and I'd check them out. And it was really the the those films on the shelf that really showed me what was accessible to me. And I was able to get them through the library. And I think, you know, Canopy is a great service where if you have a library card, you can stream movies for free with a library card. So it's still – I love the library. And actually I have a vision to create a film library, an actual library in my town with just the most robust film collection and have it be available to people in the town for free with a library card, the borrowing loaning process. I think that's great. So this isn't about filmmakers necessarily earning income. And I, and I don't quite know the answer for how our films that we make should be released and consumed. We are clearly in a very formative, reconstructive period of that medium as exhibition. The deeper question for me is, are the people in charge, do they look at films like I do? Do they see them as art? And if they do, I have faith that we'll all get there together. And it'll be some combination of streaming, of purchase, of I don't even know. And if the theatrical experience goes out entirely, we'll deal with it. I actually don't think it will because there will always be a market for that. It'll change, certainly. 
But if the people who are controlling all the exhibition do not fundamentally even consider film as art, then that future is going to be frustrating. Mm -hmm. But I think I still have some optimism that people will because I feel like people at Hulu and Amazon and other companies do feel that way. We'll see. So again, it's not about having it be one way or another because I don't know. It's too much of the Wild West right now and figuring out how films are going to be released and consumed in three years. There, there's a mixture of people and personalities and sort of viewpoints within Netflix because well, one of the places that I think that Netflix, it's very underplayed, not, not that they ever really played it up or made it a selling feature in the beginning, but it was for me was this access to foreign language content. Um, and that still exists. And, and one of, it's one of the things that I, I use Netflix for the most is access to foreign language television. And, um, but it's not something that is in any way promoted, even though like those are, those things always, you know, the, the ones that I watch, I'm giving thumbs up. Mostly I'm watching them because I've searched them out, right? Like, or I know of them through some other channel. Netflix has never recommended one of these to me. But I think about like, you know, what, what I think are some of the best shows on Netflix, uh, you know, or anywhere. There's Dark, which is a three series German, uh, German language TV television show that i literally can't say anything about without it being a spoiler but anyone should go watch it it's fantastic the, the score the acting the uh cinematography everything about it is amazing and the story is just fantastic um dark go watch it that that's a german television show that again i don't know if netflix produced that or if they licensed it in the u.s or or, or whatever but it is just a fantastic show and it gives a german perspective on um on on media that is very different than American. Another one that is a bit older, uh, but again, I've talked to you about this one as well, uh, Hotel Beau Séjour with um, Lynn Van Rooyen, she's a wonderful actress, is a Flemish language Belgian show. It's like, I would, that, that one I know, that's a, one of those Netflix originals, but it was made for a, uh, a Belgian audience, right? It was, it was played on their televisions, you know, at a specific time. Um, and then we just got it to binge but like I, I never would have been able to find that because there are other Belgian shows that I want to be able to watch that Netflix hasn't picked up and I just can't. They're not on the internet. So in that way, I mean, I think that there is still, you know, Netflix, there are some people in Netflix that are still seeking to provide access to those alternative, you know, viewpoints. I mean, this there's not as much in this sort of uh, Arabic language, but there's also some interesting Arabic language uh, television shows. So anyway, I would like to see more of that on some of these other streaming services. Um, but again, maybe it's just that I need to, because you, I feel like in any of these, you really have to know what you're looking for to get it, um, unless it's Spanish language, which is a little bit more common. But Yeah, and I think even just remembering how Netflix started as the DVD service with the most titles, it really felt like the film collector's best friend. Yeah. Like I remember when it first came out, I was a senior in high school. And, you know, the library was where I would catch up on most of my film education. But then Netflix came along and it was like they have everything. And for a subscription, you can just get these DVDs in the mail. And I and, and it was awesome. And then they shifted to streaming and then producing their own content, owning their own content, owning their own library. Because the, the money for these companies is in having a library that will make you money for the rest of time. So Netflix is big. Streaming shows are like The Office and Friends, and they didn't own those. They had you know, a closing window, so they have to create all this. They're going into debt, spending billions on content because it's a long-term play. They want to own all these amazing shows. And there are shows on Netflix that are terrible. There are shows on Netflix that are incredible, high art, because they can pay to have the best writers, directors, and cast there. So it's not even a judgment on their content. I guess what it comes down to for me is – I'm a Cohen fan. I'm a Cohen Brothers fan. And if I want to be a completist and own all their films, I can't because The Ballad of Buster Scruggs is a Netflix original and I can only watch that film through a Netflix subscription. Mm -hmm. And that, my friends, is wrong. Mm -hmm. 
as part of our journeys of self-discovery, we're going to process some things in real time. I'm currently walking through a life-changing family event, and we discuss some specific things that I've been feeling and learning during this time. We hope that it's helpful for you. Last episode, our first episode, we talked a lot about failing and pain and suffering. And I think we both come at suffering, pain, failing through a very nuanced perspective, really seeing the benefit of it, ultimately, largely. I mean, there is suffering that is unbeneficial, but a lot of things we can learn from the hard things we go to, right? That's sort of a cliche. And even like failing business-wise, you've got to fail first. Fail fast, fail often, right? That's the phrase. So my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer in October, and that was obviously the most life-changing event of 2020, which was an intensely life-changing year with highs and lows, very low lows. You know, we were going to make a film. COVID pushed that indefinitely at least a year. And for me, I had all this identity wrapped up in that film unhealthily. So that was a very crushing experience for me. And then COVID removing any work, had to go on unemployment for the first time in my life. And uh, ultimately, I found 2020 to be a really formative year because I was finally able to learn things about myself and kind of let go of things and process things. And then the year ends with my wife getting a breast cancer diagnosis. So that was intense. Thankfully, it's early stage, very high likelihood of full cure and full recovery. But it's still a journey. I mean, she's going through chemo as we speak. Uh, Tomorrow, she'll have her second of four sessions. Then she's got six weeks of radiation. She had surgery. So she's going through so much physically, mentally, emotionally. I'm going through so much mentally and emotionally and trying to support her. And all of this in the middle of my own sort of grasping at trying to make income freelance. It has been an incredible outpour of love and support from all of our friends and family. Justin and Rebecca, obviously, part of that as well, giving us uh, time, gifts, money, uh, and and that has been incredible. Just it, it's really held us up. All of the gifts, all of the love, all of the you know support in all of the different ways from our friends and family. It has really meant the world. But there have been two recurring phrases that I've heard over and over that have bothered me, and I have not. And I've been trying to figure out why they bother me, and I think I'm scratching at the reason. And I think it has to do with failure and pain. Uh, the two are, you guys got this. You got this. Yeah. Or when someone says, oh, Amanda's got this. You got this. And certainly Amanda's dealing with it in a way that I can never understand, but also we're dealing with it together. Uh, when people say, you got this. And the other one is when people refer to Amanda like, she's a badass warrior. Like, kick that cancer in the butt. Like, you're so strong. You're so brave. And those are incredibly amazing things to say and hear, but they were like hitting at something within me. And Amanda too, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking for myself, but she relates to what I'm saying. So we've, we've processed this together. We didn't feel brave. She doesn't feel brave. And she'll say, I don't feel brave because I would run away from this if I could. I have to go through this and I hate it. And I don't want to. I don't feel brave. I don't feel like a warrior. It's too hard. I, I, I have nothing... I can only suffer through it. Um, And when people say, you got this, my thought was like, I don't feel like I got this. Like I am, this is really hard. I don't feel like I got it. And you telling me I got it is not encouraging me because the tone is like, bear down, like you got it, you're stronger than this. Go, go, go. And I feel like both comments the times that I've heard them that it's bothered me, because I, I guess suppose people have said those things to me in a different sort of tone and spirit and heart, and it hasn't affected me. But the way that's pretty common and the way that has bothered me is saying those things, it, when I hear them, it feels like it betrays an aversion to pain and suffering from the other person. Like, we're scared of pain, we're scared of trauma, we're scared of suffering. And so when an event comes up, that is painful or traumatic, our inclination is to be like, no, 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 grit your teeth through it. You got it. You're a badass. As opposed to a different approach to pain could be, 
hey, this is hard. Feel your feelings. Go through that suffering. We're here. We're with you. I feel like those are the comments I'm motivated to say to my friends post, you know, this cancer diagnosis who would come to me with something very traumatic, very pain inflicting on their life or their family. It wouldn't be, oh, you got it. You're stronger than it. You can beat it. This very American, very pain averse type of rah, rah, be strong. You're brave. You're a badass. Just kick cancer in the face. It would be, your pain is real. Your suffering is real. How can I bear the burden with you? You know, it's like, give it, give it its time. Give pain, give trauma its time. There's a necessity to actually contend with our pain, to become intimate with our pain, in the words of one great um, trauma counselor. Becoming intimate with your pain is the way through it. Uh, and so this, you got this, you're a badass warrior, it hits us so off because not only do we not feel that way, but it also feels like, oh, we're supposed to be strong. Right. We're supposed to fight. We're supposed to like, I got this. I'm going to like, I'm going to just will myself through this. And that's not been my experience. It's not how we feel. And I don't think that's ultimately healthy. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, and, you know, I, I, I can quote one great trauma counselor uh, who once said the way out is through, you know, I've always found that to be very helpful. And I think, you know, I obviously I have a lot of thoughts about, you know, what you're saying. I, I agree with you. I think there is this tendency for people to say like, you know, you got this. And I think one of the things about something like that is that it, it minimizes the shit that you're about to go through. It's almost equivalent to like your kid be about to, I don't know, like have a really challenging exam or some sort of sports game and where you're like, no, you're going to be great. Like you're going to win. I know it. I, you know, I know you're going to win. And the thought process is like, I believe in you. But what it's saying is, is that like, this is going to be easy. It's not going to be a challenge, you know, because you're strong or you're good or you're smart or whatever it is. And, and it minimizes the work that has been done to lead to that point in sort of those examples or in this example of oncoming suffering or, or ongoing suffering um, of like, no, this is going to be real fucking hard. I, I think it's easier to say that because people are afraid of it. They're afraid of contending with it. My personal experience with that is that um, my, my mom died when I was 10 and she committed suicide. And it was, you know, obviously like a very formative event in my life. And the thing that I learned, and so, you know, it, it sounds like you are having a similar experience where your mind has changed or something was brought into focus that you'd never really considered before this. For me, it was, what do people say when somebody dies? And, you know, I'll ask you what somebody dies, you know, someone, you know, we're getting older, like we're not quite at the age that our parents are dying, but our grandparents are dying. What do people say, Thomas? People say, I'm so sorry. My condolences. I I'm so sorry. That's the number one, right? I don't know what to do, do with that because when somebody says, I'm sorry, it, it, culturally, that is a, it's almost, a, I'm sorry, is almost a, it's a question or I don't know what you would call it, but, but it demands a response, right? The response is, it's okay. Or, you know, oh yeah, Thomas, I, I kicked your cat. I'm so sorry, Justin, you know, you're forgiven, right? That's the other part of it. And it, so when somebody dies and then, or, or something terrible happens and they say, mm -hmm. I'm so sorry, what do you say to that? I've never been able to figure it out because in the beginning, I would say it's okay. And as a kid, like my mom's dead and people are saying like, I'm sorry. And I'm saying it's okay. That's not a healthy thing. I mean, it's not a healthy thing for an adult to say, but because it's not. And you didn't even feel that it was okay, but you felt it, you it, were... it would come out involuntarily because that's what you'd say. Like you bump into somebody. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. Don't worry about it. And that was the same thing that like that, you know, that response. And um, I, I don't know if anybody said that to you in this experience of like cancer, like, Oh, I'm so sorry. And I, I really, I hope that I didn't say anything like that. I, I mean, and the thing, the, the reality is I don't know what the right thing is to say. It seems like after, you know, 26 years, I should have like thought it through enough to know, but like when people tell me stuff like that and it might come off as flippant, but like somebody's parent died recently and I was like, that, that really sucks. That really sucks that, you know, they, they were amazing. I loved them. You loved them and they shouldn't have died. And this is a really shitty time. And I'm, I'm here if you want to talk, but, 
And it was like, that was it. I was like, and, but the thing is, is, like, I feel like that's true, though. It's like, there is nothing to be said. And like, picking something like, I'm sorry, I feel like it just kicks it to the other person. And, and that's what I don't like. You might have been the first person I told about the diagnosis. I can't remember the conversation, but it was, it was only life giving. But I'll read the note you and Rebecca wrote. So you sent us an amazing gift of six one hour massage sessions. And you said, Amanda, we hope this helps to ease some discomfort and provide you with the time and space to nourish yourself. We love you. I think that is the perfect thing to say. You know what I mean? There's no, there's no, we're sorry. There's no, you got this. There's no false sense of like strength. It's here's something to ease your discomfort and provide you with time and space to nourish yourself. So the words were nourishing. And then it came with like this amazing gift. Like, and, and those are the kind of things. And, and this is the norm. Like our friends and family are, just outpouring the love and support. And it's been only amazing. And it, it has meant everything to kind of help us get through it. And the couple times I've heard, oh, the you got this, they're from people I love dearly. And it they don't offend me. It doesn't right. bother me because I know them in their heart. I've just been tracking why certain phrases hit me a certain way. And so I've just kind of dug the work of of figuring out why is that bothering me when I hear that? It's not a judgment on the person at all. If you're listening to this and you've said that, don't even for a second yeah, think same. that I heard you saying something that I felt bothered by. It wasn't – because those closest to us, they could say anything and we, we feel their heart more than we hear and their I, words. I think part – it's it, – it, it never i've never experienced it where it felt like it was out of malice intent it is a, it is from a place of fear of reckoning with mortality fear of you know and, and where pe- people they get frozen you know not knowing what to do in that moment because when we experience it i feel like we don't always deal with it and then when you're dealing with it through somebody else it sort of you kind of panic and then it goes away right and so n- no one ever there's no class on how to deal with it but one thing i d- i did want to circle back to it you were saying that Amanda was saying, I don't feel brave. Like all I can do is suffer through this. And this is not to endorse again, obviously from what I've already said, endorse the sort of, you got this rah, rah, rah sort of thing. But I do want to challenge the idea of Amanda saying like, I'm not brave. And I think it's because of what we think of like are the way we define bravery. And this is a conversation I have a lot with my kids. And I think that there is this notion of bravery, the beaches of, you know, Normandy, but like signing up to go do that is bravery. And, 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 and that is very brave and, and, and it is, but I almost feel like the, the deciding to go do that is not the brave part. That's the selfless part. And the brave part comes when, when you're there. Bravery is, is being afraid and then doing it anyway. It's not, yeah. not being afraid of it. And, it, and, you know, she, she can kind of think about it. Like all I can do is suffer through this. That is bravery because there are people who just choose not to suffer through it. I mean, you can actually just kind of let go and stop fighting, you know, and that is not just a psychological thing. Your body will kind of give up. Wanting to, to overcome it is not always enough. You know, in, there are plenty of circumstances where things are just too aggressive, but giving up, you know, can just like let it take over. And so I think there is a certain amount of bravery that is not captured in our traditional idea of it, where it's like, but she is going to go in and she's going to do it and she is going to shave her head and she's going to, you know, move on with her life. And like, and, and there is bravery to that. Like no one's going to give her a medal for it, but that doesn't mean, you know, it's not brave. And so anyway, I just think maybe that a bit of recontextualization uh, around that might be valuable, you know, just so that she recognizes that there is a lot of bravery in the endurance of the pain. Well, and I appreciate you saying that. And you are saying the things that I am in real time kind of concluding. So there's a risk of me even processing this as we're going through it because I'm processing what I'm feeling now. And I used to resent even like the bravery thing. Like, oh, we don't feel brave. Like, we're not being brave. But even now, heading into our second chemo, I'm recontextualizing that as we go towards the same conclusion that you're talking about. It, it, in just watching how she's carrying her spirit, carrying herself. I mean, there is one option where it's like, oh, we could choose to run away and not deal with it. That's not something you really consider because you know, well, that is a pretty, that's a, that's a more likely path to actually, you know, the cancer progressing and killing you. So if you, you know, love your family, you're going to go through this other stuff. 
And even when it's hard and we're crying and we don't want to go through it, there is a there is a spirit that's emerging. There's there's a there's a peace and a joy. And honestly, you know, the shaving the head thing. Like Amanda has Amanda has chosen to go that route because you could spend time and money trying to do cold cap therapy and doing all these things to kind of protect your hair. And she's a beautiful woman and everyone's like, you have beautiful hair. And to her credit, she's like, you know what? I'm just going to embrace that the hair is falling out. And she had some friends over. They shaved her hair. And it was a really kind of lovely evening. There was a lot of laughs. And I recognize that as bravery of just the spirit of which she's approaching this and how it's affecting her, you know, her health and her body in these areas. Like she eats so healthy. She works healthy. And so this has been a slap in the face for like, wait, I've done everything right. Right. And so for her to go through this journey journey that she has no control over, that is bravery. And that's the maybe the amazing thing about bravery is it's not something you can actually choose. It happens to you. It's literally like you are blessed with bravery because you're blessed with an experience that you cannot run away from, that you are afraid, and you are going to have to go through it in spite of your fear. And I absolutely agree with that definition of bravery. It is action in the face of fear. Uh, not action absent from fear. Right, because it's hard to recognize it in the moment. You hear these stories of people like running into a building to like save somebody from a fire. And they're like, no, I'm not a hero. I just, I just, I just did it. It's like bravery feels mundane in the moment. And I think, you know, we are. Or it feels like weakness in the moment, maybe. Yeah. I mean, because. Because all you know is your fear. And the fact that, oh, if I could, I'd run away from this. Yeah. But I can't, so I'm going to face it. You could run away. And, and, and not just in the, in the very literal sense of like, well, I'm just not going to do anything and let it progress. Right. You could run away in your, in your attitude, right. She could yeah. become a monster yeah. and just like terrorize you and the kids. But like, right. it, it is difficult to maintain that spirit. You know, like I've gotten, you know, what is it? The man fluenza before where I just, you know, I'm, I'm sick and I just feel terrible. And it's like, and I have to make an active choice. And I'm not saying that this is bravery on the same level, but the point that I'm making is I, I have to make an active choice to be nice to my family. And yeah. so going through something like chemo where it's, it is like, you know, th- that same sort of thing, but more intense and longer and higher stakes. And then continuing to choose to like be a mother, be a partner, you know, that I think it takes, that is an active choice and it is, you know, it's a brave thing to do. Yeah. And I actually was having the thought last week, because early on in October, November, I was like, you know, we, you're in the thick of it. You're still dazed from the news. You're in this fog. And I'm just like, bravery? What? And even as recently as the last few weeks, I am redefining what bravery is. And, I, and, and I'm looking forward to kind of when we're on the other side of it. And I'll feel like, oh, I actually have a fuller picture now of what bravery actually looks like. Because I've watched my wife be brave when neither of us thought she was being. Like, she'll say that I don't feel this way. But I know the future that there is, on the other side of it, is a new recontextualized, new definition of bravery. And um, that actually gives me a lot of hope. Before we say goodbye, we want to give you a gift for listening this far. Two friends, two picks. Just a chance to talk about alcohol, typically. So, Justin, anything to recommend to the listeners before we wrap up today? You gave a drink recommendation last week, so I, I guess I will uh, give a drink recommendation as well. Um, this is one that I did a lot. I made this a lot over the holidays. Um, became kind of a, a fast favorite for my wife and my in-laws, and it's called a Boulevardier or or a Boulevardier. Uh, essentially, it is a bourbon, preferably rye, Campari. A sweet vermouth garnished with a you know, twist of orange um very good it's kind of like a negroni i guess it's kind of but anyway it was a good cocktail i think any time of the year but it for some reason just came up over the holidays for us if you can find angel's envy finished rye oh man that will make a top shelf one but at least in north carolina where i'm recording from that is very hard to find sounds delicious tasty very tasty especially if you're you know into those components i want to recommend a movie i just watched Two nights ago, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom on Netflix, Netflix original, but it's um, an August Wilson play 
He did Fences, which was turned into a film from Denzel Washington two years ago. And Ma Rainey's Black Bottom turned into a film. Viola Davis and Chadwick Boseman star in it. And Viola Davis should just take home the Oscar right now. She was incredible. But August Wilson teaches me more about the black experience than I can put into words. I just feel like I am shown uh, an experience within the black community that I just don't see elsewhere. And August Wilson from Fences and Ma Rainey's Black Bottom just really impacted me in a profound way. And uh, I just, they're great pieces of filmmaking, but they're better plays. And there's a reason he won the Pulitzer. Awesome. Well, we'll check it out. Good talking, brother. All right, man. All right, guys. Thanks for listening. Please help us grow our audience by subscribing to the podcast wherever you listen, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, elsewhere. Rate us, review us, tell your friends about us. If you want to stay connected to us throughout the month, you can follow our Instagram account at Two Friends Pod and get in touch with us at Two Friends with a We will have footnotes from today's episode and any links to the things we mentioned and discussed. Thomas, if people want to see your film work, where can they go? They can go to thomastory.com. Justin, where can people go to see what our company, Bad Theology, is up to? Uh, they can go to badtheologypictures.com or follow us on Instagram at badtheology. And if anyone wants to get in touch with us directly, give us feedback, give us questions to discuss, you can email us at hey at twofriendswithapodcast.com. We'll be dropping episodes every other week, so keep up with us. Thanks for listening, everybody. Am I the only one who thought that Link was Zelda back when you were a kid? No. Because the image is Link, but the name is Zelda. Did you think that? I, I did. I thought I thought Link's last name was Zelda. Because, you know, at a certain like you get into the game, there's little text boxes in the old versions and it says, you know, Link. And I was like, Oh, he must be Link Zelda? I don't know.